Good evening, everybody, and good, every, good evening, everybody online, too, and welcome to our lecture. And I'm just going to start by going over the protocols for the online attendees only. And I think you know that um, the one speech bubble is the chat feature, and anything you write in that, everyone can see, and that's for making comments. And the double speech bubbles will be questions. And these are the questions which we will present to our speakers at the end of, our, of the talk. And nothing which is said in the chat will be used for questions. So if you want to ask a question, please put it into the, the question double bubble. And um, the... That's it. And I think that uh, if the, the, the small screen on the top, if it uh, in any way impedes your view of the slides, this is the online people, then you can minimize it or you can move it around the screen so it's out of the way. Now, and I hope that's, that that's all clear for everyone. So welcome to this, the 12th lecture in the Friends series about Laconian Messenia. And this evening's talk is about excavations. And I'd like to remind you that excavations cost money, which can be hard to come by. So the Friends Fund of the BSA is directed specifically towards supporting research. So any donations you make this evening will be gratefully received. And don't forget to write Friends in the comment box at the end of the online form. And our speakers, are Professor John Wilkes and Dr. Susan Walker. Professor Wilkes, a fellow of the British Academy, taught the archaeology of the Roman provinces at the Institute of Archaeology, University College London, from 1974 to 2001. Having excavated on Hadrian's Wall in Germany, the former Yugoslavia, Italy and Scotland, he was tempted to the warm climes of Sparta in 1988 and directed the ensuing excavations of the Roman Stoa and Theatre together with his late colleague, Professor Geoffrey Waywell of King's College until their completion in 1998. And John's research interests lie in Balkan archeology, span epigraphy and history. And he's still researching the language frontier between the use of Latin and Greek from Hellenistic Greek to early Byzantine times across the Balkan region. And Dr. Walker was assistant, then deputy keeper of Greek and Roman antiquities at the British Museum from 1977 to 2004, when she moved to be keeper of antiquities at the Ashmolean Museum, Oxford. She retired in 2014, but remains an honorary curator and emeritus fellow of Wolfson College, the University of Oxford. Though her research interests became very diverse during a long museum career, Susan has remained actively engaged with Roman architecture in Greece, the subject of her doctoral thesis. And she's currently excavating a rich seam of archives in the Vatican Museum at Pusey House in Oxford, and the local archaeology room of the North Hertz Museum, Hitchin, to reveal a hitherto unknown passion of a wealthy Englishman for the early Christian archaeology of Rome. And our speakers are going to talk tonight on Sparta, a suitable place for the British archaeologist. <laughs>
Uh, I would like to begin on a personal note. Around the middle of the 1980s, I would have dismissed out of hand a prediction that I would spend my last decade before retirement from the Institute of Archaeology in London, engaged in a major program of fieldwork at one of the most historic locations of ancient Greece. In the event, that's what happened. Hitherto, my academic focus had been on research in the ancient history and archaeology of Southeast Europe, notably Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia. Then political developments after the death of Tito, along with changes elsewhere in other countries of the region, made the prospect for continuing such activities uncertain. At the same time, I read Tony Sporforth's account of Sparta in the Roman imperial era, when an idealized past was widely admired to the extent that the city became what we would now term a heritage center. Romans, later with Pausanias's guide to ancient Greece in their hand, flocked to the southern Peloponnese to enjoy the reenactment of brutal competitions among the young for which Sparta uh, was once famous. Most of the Hellenic and Roman city lies beneath modern Sparti, you see in the uh, uh, um, aerial view, um, with, the, um, with the Acropolis to the north, um, beneath, in a sense, the letters which say a suitable place, uh, the Acropolis to the north, uh, on which there were overgrown, uh, overgrown remains of structures that might reveal the physical character, if not of classical Sparta, but at least something of its Roman regeneration. Conversations with Tony Sporforth and with Susan, yeah, both then engaged in the study of the Hadrianic Panhellenion, suggested that even a limited excavation could produce valuable new evidence for the character and development of Sparta uh, in the late Hellenistic and Roman eras. An initial inquiry brought an encouraging response from Hector Cackley, then director of the British School, and no less from Dr. Theodore Spiropoulos, effort for the classical antiquities of Arcadia and Laconia. At the same time, I was aware that I was a novice in the archaeology of Greece and would need guidance in so many matters, not least modern Greek. I actually was only acquainted with a few sites, Athens, Corinth, Delphi, Delos, Mycenae, through accompanying Swan Hellenic cruises in previous years. Sparta was hardly ever on the list of, as tourists barely paused on their way to Byzantine Mystra. In this regard, salvation arrived when my London colleague, Geoffrey Waywell, alas, long gone, fluent in Greek with a long experience of excavation in Greece, came on board uh, as joint director. In the manner of the two Spartan kings, we divided uh, the task of direction amicably between us and avoided the perils of command on alternate days as practiced by the two Roman consuls that on one occasion led to disaster. <laughs> Cannae in 215 BC. It's not working again. Mm -hmm. It's just a pause about moving to the next. Oh, yeah. In is this slide three? Yes, slide two. Among an increasing number of studies devoted to the classical tradition, the Spartan tradition in European thought by Elizabeth Rawson, published in 1969, offers a remarkable account of how the idea of ancient Sparta 
has influenced political, social, and especially educational ideas in recent centuries. In 1447, the scholar and antiquarian Syriacus of Ancona made a second journey into the Peloponnese to visit the Neoplatonist Gemistos Plethon at Mystra. Passing the site of ancient Sparta, he composed verses, which you see on the left of the screen. Um, although his epigraphic uh, 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 curiosity uh, apparently did not uh, uh, suffice to make any diversion that might have yielded a rich harvest of texts yet to be recorded. With the notable exception of Nazi Germany in the past century, the admiration for Sparta as a model of political stability current in the 18th century gave way to that for the cultural and artistic achievement of Athens, uh, particularly in the 19th. Notions that the rigors of Spartan education were the inspiration for the English boarding school are now perhaps less current, but not all that long ago, it appears to find an echo in, uh, of a British prime minister uh, uh, remark uh, uh, when he chaired the BSA annual meeting of subscribers around a century ago, uh, that somehow he liked to think that the earth was being stirred over grim Sparta. To all boys, there was a peculiar appeal in Sparta uh, most of them, uh, most of them, though he thought preferred to Athens. Um, what struck me about this, which was uh, you will find in the proceedings at the back of the volume of the BSA annual, is that these remarks were delivered in November 1926. Now, 1926 uh, was a very remarkable and disturbed year in modern British history. And indeed, many believed that revolution in England had been averted through the failure of the general strike in May of that year, which, of course, was masterminded by uh, Baldwin. There we go. Come now to the BSA at uh, um, Sparta in past years. In 1906, uh, the director of the school, R.C. Bosenket, um, initiated a, pro a project on ancient Sparta that he hoped would one day even rival that of the Germans at Olympia or the French at Delphi. He was able to escape his duties in Athens, though he had to go back to perform his duties as an umpire in the revived Olympian Games in that year. On another occasion, he was summoned back to give tea to Queen Alexandra uh, uh, in the British school. Uh, but that wasn't when he was engaged uh, in Sparta altogether. Um, the shrine of Athena on the Acropolis was explored along with the theater below, while the great circuit of the Hellenistic walls Classic Sparta never had needed any walls, of course, was traced by Alan Wace. Work on the Acropolis uh, was curtailed, unfortunately, or at least fortunately, perhaps for some, by discovery of the remains of the shrine of Artemis Orthia, down below the hill next to the Eurotus. All the energies of the team, and also the finances of the school, were diverted to recovering a wealth of remains of the archaic and classical eras. But perhaps the most notable gain of this brief campaign at Sparta was the survey and mapping of the remains produced on a monumental scale by Mr. W. Sake. That still remains of great value. You will see part of it, not complete, uh, in the middle illustration. Uh, if you go in uh, to the archive room in the school, you will see what looks like a large flagpole uh, lying across one of the uh, covers. That, in sense, is Mr. Sake's original survey, uh, which uh, uh, can barely be unfurled uh, completely within the room. It's a very remarkable uh, uh, relic of that era. 
<laughs> the BSA returned to Sparta with the focus on the theatre. Uh, and two illustrations on the right uh, illustrate the work uh, of the director A.M. Woodward during five seasons from 1924 to 1928. Despite notable progress on the inscriptions on the wall of the East Paradox of the theater, excavation of the Cavea was obstructed by structures and deep deposits of occupation from the Byzantine era that required a proper record and which, uh, um, to his great credit, Woodward uh, attempted. But despite the encouraging words of Stanley Baldwin, already noted, uh, the excavation attracted little support, and Woodward and his wife often worked there in isolation. Uh, along with the work of Winifred Hobling on the Acropolis, and Mr. Cuttle engaged with the large basilica, also uh, uh, on near the top of the Acropolis. <clears throat> Beginning now with our uh, uh, campaign, we were very fortunate in securing the services uh, of workmen from the village of Afisu, our base where we had taken over the BSA dig house. Recording was the task of Susan, but of students from the Institute and King's College, along with visiting colleagues. Uh, and you can see there on the, on the right, uh, uh, seated, uh, facing the camera is Jeffrey, and in the orange um, uh, uh, T-shirt is Peter Higgs, uh, then just completing studies at Liverpool University, but now a senior curator uh, in the British Museum. The first three seasons uh, were devoted to our original selection of the Roman Stoa already identified as such in 1906 by Bosenkett. Despite problems arising from the fact that most of the structure lay within an enclosed private area, we were able to produce a plan of the entire structure with an overall length of around 188 meters, around 120 meters uh, towards the east consisted of 22 barrel vaulted chambers with uh, the 11th and 12th being apsidal, you can see um, the ones at the center, um, being apsidal and were selected for exploration. That it was a Roman date, possibly the second century, perhaps earlier, seems very probable. And a conjecture was uh, offered that it might well be uh, a reconstruction of the very famous uh, Persian star uh, recorded by Pausanias that, of course, commemorated the historic victories of Sparta in the long past. The photograph on the, on the right shows the two apsidal chambers after um, excavation, uh, and it was clear that they formed the substructures of an, uh, of an upper story that faced north uh, onto the presumed location of the Agora, an upper level of terrain that was enclosed by the late Roman defensive wall around the Acropolis. Now that appears to be confirmed by a restored <coughs> section, um, which you can see uh, in the top right, uh, which uh, shows the two-story tower the stoa facing in uh, both to the north and also to the south. And uh, this was based on evidence towards the east end, where you can see that there were significant, um, significant remains standing that enabled this reconstruction to take place. Um, the excavation of the two apsidal chambers proved rather more complicated on the evidence, uh, on account of the evidence suggesting that in the middle Byzantine period, the surviving structure had been adapted for use as a church or uh, um, uh, 
some form of community and reasonable conjecture has linked the remains with the monastic community associated with the 10th century revivalists of Nikon. This work was done very carefully by um, Jeffrey uh, while we had uh, also moved elsewhere on the Acropolis uh, and proved a very challenging and difficult uh, task. Uh, and because of the situation, we weren't able to do more than simply complete the record in that area of the stoa. But certainly it would merit, it would, uh, merit a much uh, uh, wider uh, examination of that area. Certainly particularly interesting. After three successful seasons on the Roman stoa, it had been our intention to move north and seek confirmation of our belief that the stoa had formed the southern facade uh, of the um, agora. But matters took a different turn following an invitation to coffee with the ephor at the end of the 1991 season. That was the third one on the stoa. Would we be willing to move across to the theater and provide enough information on its structure and chronology to uh, enable plans to be drawn up for making the theater a usable asset for the city. Well, Jeffrey and I uh, uh, went quite pale at this prospect, <laughs> but having gained support from the school, um, and at the same time, <clears throat> we realized that the the task, the scale of the task demanded major site management and an engagement with an existing major architectural complex, very different in character from the remains of the stoa. Much was gained through uh, selective excavation to establish details and design uh, uh, at the present condition of the Caver Coile. But the main burden of the three seasons of excavation, 1992-1994, fell upon our surveyor, Nigel Fragley, who managed to secure limited periods of special leave from his duties at the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments, then based in Salisbury. We sought to complete the excavation of most, if not all, of the remaining Byzantine structures in the area of the Cavea, along with beginning a register of the large number of architectural fragments once part of the stage building. Now this is Nigel Fragilis, and there he is hard at work with his electronic theodolite on the right. Uh, it was a staggering achievement that he managed to produce such a, a, an accurate uh, and really uh, uh, very detailed plan of the theatre. Uh, and this is his plan digitized originally, and the originals are now all in the archive in, in Athens. Uh, and you can note there the areas where we excavated, namely uh, uh, the left side of the cavea, where we completed or mostly completed the excavation of the Byzantine uh, overburden and structures in that area. And then a number of selective excavations around the outer fringe of the cavea in order to check dimensions and also the condition of the upper cavea. The lower part of the cavea uh, had been certainly uh, uh, cased uh, with marble benches, but there's some doubt as to what might have been the case uh, in the upper cavea that, uh, above the uh, horizontal gangway, the diazoma. Um, these details uh, are on the structure of the theatre, the 147 metres east to west um, between the retaining walls, and it has a diameter, the orchestra has an extended diameter of 114. The enclosing cavea is 39 metres deep with nine wedges of bench seats divided by 10 stairways. Above the horizontal gallery, the diazoma, the cavea was further divided by intermediate stairways. Finally, the survey determined 
that from the point where the caber extends beyond the semicircle, the, ink, the radius increases significantly down at the bottom areas of the, uh, um, on the left and right of the uh, uh, front of the caber. Um, during a visit to the theater, uh, uh, excavations in the 1920s, the senior German archeologist uh, Dirkfeldt suggested to Woodward that two channeled blocks of hard conglomerate stone clamped together and now incorporated in the foundations of the Roman stage building <clears throat> might belong to the runnels of a movable stage, Skyna ductilis, uh, uh, which the Latin term, that belonged to an earlier phase preceding the monumental Roman stage building. This was discounted by Woodward at the time, but in the following decade, a suggestion was repeated in 1936 in a fully detailed monograph by the German scholar Heinrich Buller. Despite doubts expressed by an American scholar <clears throat> against the arguments of Buller, there seemed need to prove the matter one way or another. And this required two further seasons of excavation uh, in the area of the West Parados, which took place um, in uh, uh, 1997 and 1998, our final two final seasons. Now these revealed a structural sequence in the area. The left-hand uh, plan shows the excavation in the area of the West Paragraphs. You can see the uh, uh, remains of the caveira in the upper part. Uh, and these revealed, uh, and these are in bold black, uh, parallel lines of what was clearly the runnels for something that was to be moved sideways out of the orchestra, uh, uh, out in front of the orchestra and into the side area of the, um, uh, of the West Paradox. And the two deep sections, which were drawn in the, uh, dug in the um, East Paradox, uh, in the West Paradox, sorry, um, revealed three parallel tracks of uh, conglomerate stone, perfectly level, uh, as we were to discover from other fragments, in, even in uh, at the other end of the of the stage building. You'll see that two of them have have uh, channels or runnels, uh, but a third step rather farther back is in the same stone clamped together, but lacking any runnels and must have been just a flat base for some sort of roller to proceed upon. Um, in the area of the, of the West Paradox, these tracks terminated um, within a scenery store, Scanothiki, into which the moving stage may well have been uh, uh, stored when not in use. In the corner was located a large dolium that I guess might have contained a lubricant that was used when smoothing the moving of the stage uh, 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 in or out of the store. Wood Woodward actually recorded <clears throat> a similar feature, a dolium, in the far diagonal corner uh, uh, on the other side of the Roman stage building. Uh, which again may have served a similar purpose. The Scanothiki was constructed with stamped bricks bearing the names of civil offic civic officials. The remains of its external buttresses still survive in the face of the wall of porous blocks that contained the end of the theater caver of the West. That is uh, above the area, you see the dotted lines outline the um, remains of the Scarathiki walls. And then immediately uh, uh, above this was the porous wall of the retaining wall of the Kavea. And in that porous wall uh, were the traces of buttresses, which on the original uh, uh, of the Scarathiki 
that indicated, to my mind, quite clearly, that the that porous wall of the conveyor was in one way or another secondary to the construction of the Scanathiki. That's a problem which remains to be sorted, but uh, it was not possible, simply not possible, to climb up or to be let down in a harness down the wall from the top on account of uh, a, a number of very, very uh, unpleasant hornets, stigurka, which uh, had taken over the um, small holes or uh, uh, in the porous wall. Uh, but there is a question yet to be examined there. Uh, and I, I'm always sorry that I, we couldn't have a complete scaffolding of it, but it will merit that one day, I think, which will give a complete profile, side profile, uh, of the original Anathiki and its dimensions. This phase, when the Roman stage building replaced the arrangement of the moving stage, it seems uh, likely that uh, the Scanathiki, uh, though it may have been retained uh, uh, in use uh, for some period, was uh, dismantled and its bricks were used to uh, create an ornamental fountain which you see the oval and the nymphaeum indicated in the left side of the, um, uh, of the Scanathiki. And this was fed apparently by a diversion of the uh, aqueduct channel, which had originally certainly ascended uh, the uh, Acropolis Hill um, behind, behind the theater. That again is uh, uh, awaits further investigation. The final phase of the Roman era was the incorporation of the theater cavea into the late Roman defensive wall, which I would judge from the evidence we had, and the evidence is not conclusive, took place in the aftermath of Alaric's activities in the Peloponnese uh, uh, towards the, at the end of the uh, uh, fourth century and in the early years of the fifth. And it's very likely that the perimeter wall, certainly an earlier date in my judgment, can be ruled out. Um, we then, uh, uh, um, the wall itself continues uh, with reused blocks from the Roman stage uh, around the southern part of the uh, Acropolis Hill and then move uh, eastward to uh, link up with the stoa. So such is, our, uh, uh, I hope, not too summary account. This um, uh, final illustration shows the channel blocks uh, as they were clamped together and in situ. There is no doubt that they were runnels. You could see the traces of wear on them, and they were certainly perfectly aligned uh, in situ. Uh, the excavation uh, in that respect proved a success. Um, but there is so much yet to be learned from even very modest uh, um, uh, uh, trenches within this very remarkable uh, building that one day I certainly believe could prove a great asset to Sparta. Thank you very much indeed. Switch over. The uh, Euroclid family had been permitted to manage early Roman Sparta as a private fiefdom within the province of Achaea, and it is they who most likely commissioned the first marble theatre, which, as you have seen, would have been a massive undertaking involving the re-landscaping and terracing of the site and an adjustment to the orientation of the earlier uh, Hellenistic cavea. Now, this somewhat Ariviste family, uh, who are described by Tony Sporforth as, as privateers or, or even pirates uh, uh, in the early phase of making lots of money, enjoyed mixed relations with the first emperor Augustus 
but managed to cling to power in Sparta through the middle of the first century AD. Sparta's unusual status ended with the collapse of the Julio-Claudian imperial dynasty on the suicide of Nero in AD 68. The general Vespasian emerged victorious after a year of military conflict over the succession to the imperial throne. And Vespasian gave the Spartans a new uh, stage building, a new theater, to, in, which in a sense reflected the new identity of Sparta as a provincial Roman town of some antiquarian interest. The theater now came to resemble many such buildings erected throughout the empire. Its stage redeveloped as a monumental architectural screen with the capacity to show statues of the good and the great. The paradox walls of the slightly enlarged cavea were adorned with records of the distinguished careers of locals engaged in the political life of Roman Sparta, including the management of the theater. It's been estimated that the capacity could have been up to 17,000 people, and the building could be used for political events, pantomime and contests, as well as classical dramas. So we have to see this building as, as a very multifunctional, large, um, in a sense, enclosed. I mean, it's not roofed, but it could uh, uh, be seen as, as a place where an awful lot of people could be concentrated together for um, a, a wide variety of activities. Going back to the 1990s excavation, uh, to record and study the architecture of the Roman stage and the seats of the cavea, we needed to create a path into the orchestra which was then littered with architectural elements and move these pieces out uh, to a field immediately to the southeast where each element was numbered, recorded and studied. And Topler, uh, these are photos taken in 2014, uh, but essentially the path pathway is here and you can just about see the architectural elements in the olive trees uh, towards the top of this picture. And here is a, a more detailed picture uh, of them in their new home. And then uh, lower left, you see John here with uh, Yanis Constandelos, um, and they're watching the lifting of a very elaborately decorated and massive shaft out of the Theater. So this, this was a huge operation that took place in uh, 1993. And here you can see uh, Panayotis, I think, is, is, is yes. driving the, uh, the, the crane to uh, uh, lift these piece, pieces out and move them. Um, and also you can see on the right, um, our colleague, Dr. Hafid Welder, um, recording elements that were still in the theater. And Hafid's board is resting on a standard Roman Corinthian capital, um, you see down here, which comes from the Roman stage building. And his hand is on an epistyle block, that's a combined architrave in frieze that would have sat on top of uh, the uh, order of, of columns. Um, Hafford introduced a system of recording uh, these sorts of finds and also recording the new excavation adapted for Sparta from the Museum of London's urban excavations where he previously worked. And this was a very highly structured system but allowed for detailed individual observation recorded in drawings. On the left of this slide, you may observe the fate of the Augustan uh, stage building, the Euclid uh, um, building, uh, where you can see uh, its permanent elements uh, of the, the, the stage were built in the Doric order, um, of which uh, 
you can see parts of a capital uh, upside down here as Doric capital. There's a detail in it down below. And part of a fluted uh, column drum here, now packing the foundations of Vespasian's gift. The Roman stage building had a long and complex life with many extensions and reconstructions. Any heavy facade of this sort is very vulnerable to earthquake and Sparta suffered a serious one in AD 375. Restorations to the theater were funded by the provincial governor Anatolius and uh, it's possible that he might be the subject of this crude but imposing portrait head that had rolled in the fifth century into the drain of the orchestra. Certainly the city of Sparta dedicated a statue to Anatolius in gratitude for his attention and for his gift of the resources needed for the repair, repair the completion of which was also recorded in an inscription to the emperors Arcadius and Honorius incised on an architrave of the stage building. And now we can't be sure of this, the head might be uh, a bit uh, earlier in date than that. But interestingly, both the head and the base on which the honor to Anatolius is uh, recorded, um, the latter found in the eastern uh, paradox of the theater. You can see it uh, here on the uh, right-hand photograph. Um, both of them are, seem to have been recut from chunks of column shaft. And the intervening draped torso, if the head and base do indeed belong together, would almost certainly have been reused from a statue of someone whose good deeds had been forgotten. By the uh, end of the fourth century, there was no freshly cut marble to be had in Sparta. And in the Roman Empire <coughs> as a whole, most public statues now represented Roman governors and emperors rather than local worthies. Uh, Athens is an exception to this rule, as it is in, in many things, but by and large, that's how things work. And as for the quality of the head, carving skills had by this stage declined as a result of a substantial shrinkage of the Roman marble trade. So the availability of good carving stone had uh, dramatically lessened. And also there was a dramatic lessening of public commissions of three dimensional statues. Within a decade or so of this last effort to maintain the theater, the city faced a man-made external threat in the shape of, of the Goth leader Alaric. And most likely as a response to Alaric's demanding incursions, many of the theater's seats and much of its decorative architecture was recycled for the more mundane but necessary purpose of defense. The late Roman city wall, as John mentioned, wrapped around the western end of the stage building and went up the western side of the cavea, turning at the top to cross the heights of the Acropolis and plunge down its southeast slope, the site of the Agora appearing as a potential fort within a fortress. It's always significant when looking at defense systems to note what lies inside the circuit wall and what is left unprotected. Both the theater and the Roman stoa were within the walls of the anxious city, and this is by no means the end of the story. So just to show this is on that wonderful map of 1906 that John mentioned that the um, wall incorporates the end of the stage building it then shoots up here over the top of the over the top of the acropolis down enclosing the agora which looks like almost as though it could be a sort of fortress within a fortress as it were and then comes back below the roman stoa so both the stoa 
um, and uh, at least part of the theatre uh, are within it. I confess that uh, we were disappointed to see the state of the theatre on our last visit back in 2014. Public access was discouraged and the paths were rather treacherous and our trenches from the 1990s were still open. So I was very pleased to find that by that year, a feasibility study for the theatre's future landscaping and management had been completed. Uh, thanks to EU regional funding and uh, a lot of um, prompting uh, and groundwork uh, in the dynamic support of the Greek organization, the Azuma, which seeks to raise funds and public awareness of the magnificent ancient theatres of Greece. And as John indicated, it was in fact for this purpose that we had been invited uh, by the archaeological Ephoria to uh, explore the theatre in the 1990s. So there are new excavations which have been underway since 2021. By that year, we had transferred the entire Spartan, Sparta excavation archive of the 1990s to the British School, and I hope that good use is being made of it. I hope too that the end result will actually be a bit less tidy than the digital elevation uh, on the right of this slide. This theater was a lively hub of urban life for more than a millennium. And we haven't even got to the turnip eaters. Uh, and I'm now going to hand back to John to give you news of this unexpected discovery of turnips in the Western uh, Cavea, a place that many people called home for several centuries. Just a brief word. The, the modern excavation requires not only picks and shovels and trowels and uh, measuring, but also uh, the analysis of deposits, something which is now quite current and has been for certainly more than half a century. And the, the generally two methods. One was dry sieving, in which you had a gigantic sort of riddle and you shook it and picked out seeds and other organic <clears throat> material. The other was wet sieving, a most unpleasant uh, experience and, and something which uh, most people preferred to stay away. It was very messy. And there was water everywhere and mud and so on. Anyway, less on that. <clears throat> uh, in 1989, uh, when we were uh, much engaged with the stir, uh, and one of the advantages is that uh, some of my colleagues from the Institute of Archaeology were ever eager to get at material, and they set up dry sieving for the occupation material from one of the stir chambers. And towards the end of the experience, they came to see me in a state, uh, Jeffrey and I, in a state of excitement to say that they had found part of a turnip, uh, which um, I have to say, I said, oh, jolly, well, jolly good. But apparently, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the point about it is this part of the turnip was in a secure, securely stratified, and there was no doubt, and that it came from what? is clearly the middle Byzantine era. There'd been much debate apparently on the monastic diet uh, in uh, Byzantine Greece and suggestions had been made that this was of a very limited character and that uh, uh, tubers, vegetable uh, uh, um, roots were on the whole not uh, widespread. And so in terms of the, if you like, the range of um, uh, of food that was produced. The discovery of um, the middle Byzantine turnip uh, at Sparta uh, caused quite a deal of excitement. Uh, and I uh, commend you, this is, it is in um, historic botany um, and a, a group of uh, a very high powered specialists proclaimed the importance of this in a paper that was published 
uh, uh, while we were still excavating at Sparta. So things turn up that you never expected. Um, and um, uh, that one of the great pleasures of excavation uh, or, or disappointments can be that things turn up that you did not want uh, or even couldn't even imagine. Anyway, thank you. Right, that's it. Thank you very much. But thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful. And I, I, I particularly like the way in which you um, took, walked us through the stages of the excavation of the different areas of the of, of ancient Sparta. Um, it really that helped it kind of clarify quite a lot of things in my mind. My have we oops. Okay, and um, can I remind people of the protocols again about the, the difference between the chat and the, the questions? And can, can I, how can I look at the... Okay, all right, okay. Um, one, one of the things which are, it, it's not exactly a question, but there's something um, someone uh, told me very recently about, I was walking along the street in Sparta with someone from the archaeological service, and we walked past the officers club. I don't know if you, you know that the, building. The officers club in Sparta. It was built in, in, in the 1890s. Oh. And they, they showed, they, as we walked past, they said, there's where all the blocks from the theatre went and they're built oh. into the walls of this, oh. this, uh, this um, 1890s, beautiful, this. very beautiful neoclassical yeah. building, really neoclassical. Mm. Yes. Um, so here's a, an, an anonymous person has said, in which year did the Roman Empire take control of Sparta? Uh, technical control, probably 146 BC, when the province of Achaea was established, but de facto, um, uh, probably uh, in the early second century after Macedonian power was removed in one, 197, 1998, uh, by, in a sense, uh, uh, Macedonia was confined to Macedonia and lost its hold over Greece. Um, Sparta always remained, um, uh, as it were, a part uh, within um, Achaea until it was forcibly overthrown in the 180s and was simply relegated to just one city and the entire traditional Spartan constitution was uh, done away with. That's based on my memory, but I think that's probably what happened. That's right. Thank you. I hope I think that. And Sparta, that Sparta gained very special favour because during the campaign that led up to um, uh, Actium and the victory of uh, um, Caesar Octavian over Antony and Cleopatra, Sparta was one of the um, places which stood out against um, uh, the um, stood out against the Antonians, and also had it sheltered the family of Livia, Augustus's empress, uh, during the proscriptions which took place in the forties. And Sparta, uh, unlike Athens, which was rather given a cold shoulder by the first emperor. Um, Sparta uh, was given a unique honour in which Augustus and Livia travelled north, presumably from Yithian, um, and then um, to which was given to Sparta as a gift by uh, Augustus, and died with the ephors in Sparta. Uh, and this was regarded as a, a, a quite an astonishing uh, gesture of friendship and um, favour. 
uh, which they were to enjoy uh, during the Julio Claudian era, as, as Susan said. Yes, that's very, that's very really interesting. I didn't know about Livia's family being a shelter in Sparta. So, here, a, a question I'm not sure you, you can answer this. David Blackman asks, What are the plans for future BSA work at Sparta? <laughs> I don't think we can. Yes, I don't think. I, I, well, uh, as I said, we did transfer the archive from our excavations to the school, and I, I think the um, Greek Archaeological Service, who's working there at the moment, I hope will use that. But I, I'm, I don't. We don't know of any yes. other plans. There's yes. plenty of scope for more work to be done in Sparta. Yes. Oh, yeah, Re Rebecca Sweetman. The uh, Professor Sweetman, the current director, has she's responded. She said, "We would love to get some work done on the legacy data, and we want more geophysics." <laughs> okay, so here's a question: Besides the governor, were there any other statues found in the theatre? Yeah. Uh there, yes, there was a head of uh, a woman who sometimes identified uh, as a priestess. Um, and also uh, a torso, and Woodward found statues uh, in his campaigns, in or bits of statues in, in the 1920s, all of which are in Sparta Museum. Um, Geoffrey Waywell and I published a brief note on the find from these excavations of the 1990s in the annual of the school, uh, for 1995, and there is a Greek catalogue uh, of the um, uh, portraits in the Sparta Museum by uh, Alcmini Datsoulis Devridis. So, yeah. Okay, I think that answers that question. I have to make this one. I can't. There's another question. Oh, okay, this is from David McIntosh. When talking about state deconstruction, when do we see Sparta finally fall into ruin in the late Roman, early Byzantine period? Um, the evidence is negative because there is a, a complete absence um, of what you might call the characteristic um, ceramic deposits uh, and also any coins of what you might think of as the period of Byzant early Byzantium, say from the middle of the fifth uh, to the um, seventh uh, 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 area. Often areas where you do get very substantial deposits but these are lacking in Sparta. Uh, the, uh, but that's a negative evidence. In other words, we may just no, have um, not found uh, <laughs> we, we may just have um, uh, uh, missed a lot of, of things. You dig somewhere else, there might well be. But the evidence I would conclude it is that there's a feeling that, that that not a lot was taking place during, if you like, the revival of Justinian and that, that, that yes. era. But that's a guess. Which then, yes. On negative evidence. And the, um, I, 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 I know myself from working on the, the pottery from the old excavations in the theatre, that there is the, a lacuna of that date, but there's plenty of pottery of the 8th and 9th centuries. So there's a, there's a, a gap. So the next question is, for, this is from Karina Oakley. For someone who's interested in getting some archaeological experience, what would you recommend? <laughs> so, uh, uh, go to your local museum. <laughs> well, it depends. Yes, it depends where you want your archaeological experience to be. Doesn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, either through uh, local museums or or societies, or or indeed check out what is going on 
in uh, with uh, expeditions abroad. Yes. Um, I'm afraid we're, we're both rather past it, really. <laughs> so we we, I, um, we don't, uh, is archaeology abroad still published? I don't know. Uh, no, okay. no, I don't think that's not. That's no. <laughs> but, but my, for uh, an archaeologist, one of the most productive areas of expertise is that of Roman pottery and uh, late Roman pottery, um, because that is very often uh, in areas like in place like Sparta that's likely to turn up in quantity. And uh, we were very fortunate in securing on at least two occasions the, uh, uh, the presence of John Hayes. And yes. John Hayes is, is never very very frail and in a home, but his achievement of pottery uh, across the late Roman Mediterranean is absolutely immeasurable of what he has done with tracing sources, patterns of movement, etc., etc., most of which has stood the test of time and been converted by excavation. And one of the features was that members of the of the local archaeological service in Sparta who were battling with uh, a lot of new development taking place in the area of the Roman Hellenistic city, were getting mosaics, were getting structures and so on with masses of pottery, and they were all too eager for, for John Hayes to come and look at what they've got and give them some judgment. So the arrival of Hayes would, would, would or the uh, promised arrival of Hayes, would uh, uh, excite several people in the service to come and try and persuade him to look at their material too. And it's a measure of Stephen. So my advice was get get on top of a class of pottery uh, and you'll never go hungry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so this is James Lloyd. Thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. What would you say is currently the most important thing to better understand about the archaeology of Sparta or which period? Well, you pointed to work needing to be done. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. The worst yeah. paradox, it's hard yeah. to know where to start, yeah. really. I mean, Sparta is one of those sites. <laughs> I mean, it's huge. Uh, and the theatre and the stoa are only a small part of it. And Sparta will go on producing um, archaeology of quality for as long as anybody cares to investigate it. So I think uh, Rebecca's prob probably right in saying what really needs to happen is a lot more survey yes. uh, using modern techniques that yes. will um, uh, really indicate where, where the priorities now now lie. And of course, a lot of archaeology is determined by development. So in a sense, in Sparta, you've got a protected archaeological zone on the Acropolis. Uh, and then uh, uh, most of the uh, ancient city is actually sitting underneath modern Spartese. So yes. there's, you know, there's a lot of areas that are privately owned or, or ripe for development, which will then necessitate um, you know, as, uh, I remember on the occasion when they were putting a new drain sewer down the middle of the of Paleologu, which was the main street, which the Axis Street of Sparta, um, almost as they dug, mosaic after mosaic after mosaic began to appear. Yes. And of course, they could only uh, take about a metre, record a metre of it. But it's quite clear that beneath at a depth of about two to three meters, there are very significant remains beneath modern uh, uh, parts of the utilities have gone into them, but there's quite a lot of material there. And it would be a, a great benefit if uh, when a, a house was rebuilt, um, if, the, if the really thorough um, sort of city of London type exploration could take place. And I think there's quite a lot to be learned. Um, the 
stoa, uh, probably because of its reuse, was stripped completely of its marble veneer, which covered those, uh, uh, they were uh, uh, water sources. There was a water pipe in, yes. the, in the back of them. Uh, and there's no doubt that quite a lot of these areas were, um, were very severely, um, as it were, degraded, uh, for probably for use uh, elsewhere. Um, but the, the, uh, a lot of areas area still would repay examination. And uh, there is an area, the, the probably part of the Agra, which yielded the great bronze statue, I think, of, was it Julia Domna, which is now in the National Museum in, in, in um, Athens. So in terms of quality of material, there's probably quite a lot to come. And that plateau is, is very much, but it is privately owned by, um, by uh, people with uh, uh, valuable olive trees. We had to buy an olive tree to get at the stoa originally, uh, uh, the most expensive olive tree in, in all of the Peloponnese. <laughs> okay, the, uh, this is for um, the person who was asking about how to get onto excavations. The director has written that the BSA has lists of projects where they take people, so if you just get in touch, do you want um, she also refers to something called Date Magazine. David McIntosh says thank you. Uh, do you know anything about the tomb of Leonidas? Here's ah, a, the here's a, building. Here's a question. Someone, Jonathan Hall says, I'll be taking a group of University of Chicago students to Sparta next month. What's the latest thinking about the so-called tomb of Leonidas? Uh, I, I don't know what the latest thing, uh, thinking is, but I've just gone back on the screen to uh, the elevation of the Roman stoa, and to the left of it, you can see the foundations of a round building, um, which predates the stoa, which, uh, uh, and also the uh, um, western side of the agora, which you can just see beginning at, uh, at the top left of the plan, it's labeled southwest corner of the Flatea. Uh, so this is sometimes taken to be the tomb of Leonidas. I, I'm not aware of any evidence for that identification. Um, except uh, it's a, the type of building is one that is often used for uh, royal burials, particularly um, in the late classical and Hellenistic period. And it uh, was certainly uh, apparently respected by uh, builders of these later constructions. So even though it sits right on the corner, um, of the agora, it seems to have survived without yeah. being the, built over. The, built, the, the round building was, I, I'm correct, briefly explored in the 1890s by um, uh, uh, the American school, but the results were inconclusive and they didn't continue. But there is a brief report on that, I think. So, I mean, what we can say about it is, is that it is of a scale and a, a design that would be appropriate for a very grand uh, mausoleum. Um, and it is respected by later builders, even though yes, it's in a very true. awkward yes. place, right where they want to do the corner of the Agora. Uh, but um, uh, they respect it. So what, whatever was in it was very significant. Whether that was Leonidas, I don't, there's no, there's yes. no evidence for that, as far as I'm aware. Okay, thank you. That's a very helpful answer. So H Hector Williams says, I seem to recall a number of Roman atrium houses found in salvage excavations at Sparta which suggest a close attachment to Rome in the first century. Are there enough remains of the Roman 
Spinia fronds to reconstruct it, even in part on paper. Um, I think that should be possible. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it, it's um, a very complicated sequence of building uh, the stage facade. And we didn't really get to a point where we could be absolutely confident of uh, a reconstruction. Um, it, it's, uh, it would require um, further study than we were actually able to do. But I do think that um, at the West End in particular, the facade seemed to have uh, fallen on its face and it really ought to be possible to, uh, so yes. to speak, lift it back up again. So I have, I, I do have hope that, that 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 will that will come and be possible. Yes, but that would be at least um, the uh, late first century um, facade. Uh, I mean, this is going to be a difficulty for whoever works on turning the theatre into a usable asset for Sparta today, um, which period of the theatre's history, which runs after all for over a millennium, which are you going to pick to remake yes. the theatre? Yes. Uh, and uh, I think one will they'll probably end up with a bit of an amalgam that, that they would get uh, something that began in uh, life in the Flavian period, but then was added to, there looks to have been an upper story uh, um, built perhaps as late as the Siberian period, for example, but there's an awful lot of making and remaking in that facade. Um, so it's yes, going to be a complicated very, very business, good. but I, yes. I, I, I would think it should be possible, yes. Well, that, that's so much uh, This is a question when it it's asking about your opinion, really. And John actually referenced this when you said, you, you said in passing, the, the coaches go through Sparta and Pi bypass the ancient site on their way to Mistra. Mm -hmm. And the, the question is, why do you think so much money is spent on Mistra and not on Sparta? Yes, yes. Well, um, it, Mistra has all has an aura to it, which um, alas, Sparta uh, doesn't. Uh, I mean, it's a, uh, there's a passage in um, in uh, Evelyn War, uh, who expresses his who was a, then a, a tourist in the thirties, expresses his complete disappointment with Sparta, but being entranced by Mistra, and I think this was uh, the feeling that if you were down in that part. Yes. Um, uh, that you, uh, um, it was Mistra that you you, you 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 paid your respects to. Even though I think I may be wrong here, but most of what we see at Mistra today, uh, uh, what survives, actually belongs to the period of the Turkish rule. Uh, mm -hmm. um, whereas a lot of the, I mean, obviously the the main Christian uh, structures uh, antedate that, but most of the domestic houses along the street. Uh, it was a huge and flourishing place in the 17th century, if I remember. But, yes. Yeah. Well, our late friend Fergus Miller used to say, the more you look, the later it gets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, the fact is that, you know, you, you are going to see an awful lot more in uh, uh, medieval and early modern settlements than you are in ancient ones. And uh, uh, we, you know, there's an, it, you have to do an awful lot of work on the Acropolis to make these structures meaningful for um, uh, the public to visit and appreciate them. Um, and that's how it is, I'm afraid. Yes, yes. yes. What is the name of the bar? This girl who's now in Nottingham who did the pottery. Claire, Claire, Claire. Claire. Yes. Um, I'd just like to um, uh, uh, make one little um, uh, observation. When we started digging, uh, we decided we would keep 
all the pottery and with a capital A, everything that came out of excavation we kept. And the majority of this clearly was not of, uh, uh, of the ancient period and some of it even was quite modern. But uh, we kept it and crate after crate, bag after bag was taken every week into the Ephoria, much their horror. <laughs> But we found eventually uh, Claire Pickersgill, who is now curator in the museum at uh, University Museum in Nottingham, uh, did a doctoral thesis uh, here uh, on the medieval pottery of Sparta uh, and was uh, with the guidance of Guy Saunders, of the uh, uh, former deputy director now. Uh, I think still at Corinth is uh, for the American uh, excavation, did uh, a, a wonderful thesis and published a monograph, a, a good paper in the BSA. And what they've done, this is, these are in a sense new facts to the extent that we can now see patterns of uh, import and movement of pottery, both from the islands, the uh, Aegean islands, and also from Italy, uh, or rather southern Italy and the west. And you could uh, see how the, the balance shifted at various periods. And this was one of the great gains, I thought. Um, and it's a remarkable field because the amount of pottery is huge. It's very diagnostic, uh, uh, comes from uh, uh, what you might call domestic uh, context. Uh, and was one of the most in encouraging, despite the fact that it provided us with a huge burden of, of material. It, in the end, yielded, I think, uh, uh, valuable results. Um, yes, that's very good, Ms. Book. We wish we had more excavations which um, did this and had these profitable results. No, thank you very, very much indeed. I think it was a really enlightening lecture and I think it will be enjoyed by everybody, but particularly all of us who are going on our trip. We've all been enlightened quite a lot about what, what's going on. Now, I just wanted to uh, say something very quickly. This is the final in-person lecture in our series. And the last two lectures are will be online from Stephen Duckworth on the 28th of March, this day yeah. next week, and Tony Spoforth on the 4th of April. But um, as this is the, our last lecture in person, I just want to thank all those who've made these events possible. And first of all, with, we have overwhelming gratitude to our speakers tonight and on every other evening. And without them, it just, well, these lectures wouldn't have happened. I've enjoyed great support in setting up this series from two directors, from Professor Bennett and Professor Sweetman and the Chair of Council. Their help has been immeasurable. And then there's everyone who tuned in to listen and buoyed us up with their enthusiasm. That was great. It was very encouraging. But finally, I, I really want to thank Kate, without whom nothing would have been possible. And most of you, I think, are really unaware of how much she's done behind the scenes to make each lecture run smoothly. And for her technical wizardry in the delivery of the online lectures. And I'm sure you'd all like to show your appreciation to her. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And if you'd like to come along now and enjoy a glass of wine. Yeah. Yeah.